All right. Great to be back here. So um, I'm going to just be talking a little bit about the work that we're doing with uh, rapamycin for long COVID. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to spend a short amount of time just talking about the trial itself and then a little bit about what we hope to happen after this particular trial, as well as after a lot of our, our trials, our sort of overall uh, clinical trial strategy, um, which I think might be relevant for many of the talks that, that have happened already in this really great uh, session this morning. So starting off, uh, just why rapamycin in general? Uh, rapamycin, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a sort of an mTOR pathway inhibitor. Um, on label, it is used in folks who are going through um, organ transplantation, and it is used to suppress the immune system at high doses. However, at low doses, it has a little bit more of a sophisticated immunomodulatory effect, and that's what we're interested in. We applied for the, the grant to uh, study low-dose rapamycin in folks with long COVID off the back of uh, the work that we did with Akiko Iwasaki's team at Yale, where we showed that folks with long COVID tended to have reactivation of latent uh, viruses, especially EBV, but other herpes viruses as well. Uh, immune dysregulation, so we saw B cell dysregulation, we saw evidence of T cell exhaustion, and also chronic inflammation. So these were some of the, the three big findings from our Nature paper in 2023. And what we know about rapamycin is it has been shown to significantly reduce the number of infections and reinfections that older adults experience when given in low doses. So maybe it's targeting uh, reactivation of pathogens. It reverses immunosenescence and enhances T cell functioning. So maybe we can see you know, it helping this immune dysregulation effect. And it also stabilizes inflammatory cytokine secretion. So maybe some of this chronic inflammation is going to be suppressed in, in our participants. It's also an mTOR inhibitor, so it has a lot of really good effects on mitochondrial function as well. That was not necessarily the first reason we were selecting it, but it's something to note and name that maybe we're gonna see some improvements um, in, in this as well. In terms of what the trial looks like and who we're, we're taking in this particular trial, so it is double-blind, placebo-controlled RCT. Um, we're gonna have 80 participants randomized one-to-one -one in this trial. Um, inclusion criteria will be folks with long COVID who meet CT CDC criteria, clinical case definition, who have been symptomatic for at least 12 months, who um, have a baseline EQ5D VAS of less than 70, but also prior to their um, index infection were over 80. So they need to be you know, somewhat, uh, somewhat physically disabled by, the, by, by their long COVID diagnosis, but also had to be living in quite good health prior to their COVID infection that triggered the illness. Um, exclusion criteria, uh, pre-existing, uh, so prior to index infection, existing IACI diagnoses are excluded for this trial. This was important from an FDA uh, IND standpoint when we were applying for sort of permission to use this to assist with labeling. So um, that's going to be an exclusion. To be clear, folks can be included if they have a ME-CFS diagnosis that occurred after their long COVID diagnosis. So that is still allowed in, in the trial. So people can be long COVID diagnosed and ME-CFS diagnosed um, so long as the long COVID diagnosis is, is the primary diagnosis, meaning that they developed their ME-CFS after a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, history of organ transplantation, we wanna sort of keep away from that right now in this trial. Um, and any known hepatic or renal impairment simply because there, there is some data to suggest that it can affect um, liver and kidney function. Uh, our dosing schedule, 
Uh, this is what everyone seems to be most interested in. We get a lot of emails about this. So it's, it's a weekly, a single weekly dose, and we're going to ramp up. So we're going to have a dose escalation schedule because what I can tell you pragmatically, because some of our physicians in our clinic prescribe low-dose rapamycin already, is that if you just go straight up to six milligrams a week, which is what is used in some of the longevity clinical trials, that's a lot for a long COVID or an ME-CFS patient. Um, so, and we, what we haven't seen is any adverse events sort of in the clinical sphere at about four milligrams per week. So we're gonna slowly escalate the dose up. So one milligram once per week for two weeks, two milligrams once per week uh, for two weeks, and then four milligrams once per week for two months. Um, this was a protocol that low dose rapamycin is, is kind of new on the scene. So this was a protocol that was done in collaboration with talking to patients who have tried it, talking to physicians who prescribe it a lot, and talking to a few sites around the United States. I think there's just only three or four sites around the United States who are using it in clinical trial right now and just getting a sort of practical feel for what would be the best. Progress right now, we're, we're blinded. I can't tell you, you know, what's going on, but I can tell you that we've been open for recruitment for three weeks and we have consented 30 patients. So there is an aggressive push for this, this trial. We're, we're getting a lot of emails every day, which we really appreciate. It's a highly engaged community. So in terms of making the most of every participant, I just want to just spend my last few minutes talking about clinical trial strategy. Um, I want to uh, talk about the fact that what we plan to do in this clinical trial is multi-omic analysis alongside our pen and paper, you know, um, uh, patient reported outcomes. So we're going to be doing detailed symptom tracking. We're going to be doing deep immune profiling T cell for T cell exhaustion, EBV and herpes virus reactivations, metabolomics, uh, plasma spike analysis, all of these things to try and understand why this is working. The reason why is if you've been paying attention to all of the other talks, every single drug that we try in the IACI community, we hear, well, it works for some people and not for others. We want to be able to, from this trial, we do not anticipate we're going to have a 100% response rate. We want to be able to identify who's responding and why they're responding based on their biomarkers so that then we can move into a larger trial where we only recruit people who have biomarkers of response. This, this is our goal. Um, you know, this is the, the quiet part out loud. We're not expecting that everyone will do perfectly in this trial. And the final step in our strategy, which I, I also want to name, is we also don't think that IACI, and I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm so hopeful that I'll be proved wrong on this, so don't take this as me saying it's a fact. It's just me saying, right now, I don't think that IACIs are a single drug solution problem. So what we want to do is once we have the results from these trials where we understand what you know a high response rate looks like, we then want to start to develop adaptive platform trials where we can do very sophisticated combination therapy approaches to understand how we can, we can mix and match different drugs based on different biomarkers of patients, very similar to what Michael was saying in his speech so that we can come up with combination therapy approaches that are really actionable and meaningful and give us more than a 10 or 15% bump on symptom burden, but now we're talking about 40, 50, 60, 70% symptom burden bumps. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much to, uh, for your attention and these are all the people to thank. Thank you very much for this presentation and for the perspective it gives and there's a question of the uh, on the online uh, are there any subgroups for whom rapamycin would be particularly effective maybe patients with a hyperimmune response with very high order antibodies makes them the variant to make them sick yeah you know it's interesting i i we we don't know yet um, our hypothesis is very much targeted almost toward the other direction. So we're, we're thinking about rapamycin less in terms of autoimmunity and more in terms of T cell exhaustion and sort of 
an immune system that is tired. And so the phenotype that we think about are folks who are sort of consistently testing positive for all sorts of viruses, CMV, EBV, herpes viruses, getting sick very often. D, T cell dysfunction, you're directly. T cell dysfunction. So this is um, a good answer to this question. So it's not the outer antibody, it's a T cell dysfunction, which is hope, main, main patient in my patients as well. Okay, other questions? Here in the middle, in green. <laughs> Green is calling. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm wondering, yesterday and today, we always heard about T cells, B cells, NK cells, and so on. Nobody is looking at the short living ones, namely neutrophils. Is there any specific reason for not looking at, at this type of cells? Don't tell me short living, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I. I I, no other reason other than in the deep immune profiling that we're doing, we're not seeing anything in the neutrophils to give us an actionable target. So the deep immune profiling pro projects that we've done with the Kiko and that we've published on, neutrophil, neutrophil function was more or less normal, which do doesn't mean that we're ignoring them, it just means that it's not giving us an actionable target you know, and that you know, the rationale for this study is we have seen actionable T cell dysregulation and B cell dysregulation. So this is the next step: is to try and target that and see what happens. Thanks. My question to this is: and subpopulation of the neutrophils, uh, monocytes, eosinophils, do they give us information and in targeting? I, I definitely think yes. I think that we're, um, uh, I, I think that we're, our particular work, we're too small of an N to really understand the picture completely, but I think we're gonna get there. Thank you very much. As a short question, not, yeah, there's one question, yes, please. Hi, David, thank you um, for your talk and everything you're doing also for uh, the community. I was uh, looking at the dosing schedule you presented and I thought it's a little different to what you um, presented earlier uh, in other presentations in dosing uh, one milligram every week, weekly, and I saw this was a two weekly schedule. If I'm correct in uh, establishing that that's a little different to earlier presentations, um, I was wondering uh, if, if there's any reason uh, why, that, why that change occurred. Uh, no, no, I don't think I don't think I've presented anything different. So one milligram yeah. per week for two weeks, two milligrams per week for two weeks, and then four milligrams per week for two months. Okay, it's so uh, not up to six. Not going up to six. Okay. Yeah. Then I'm wrong. Thank you. Um, it, it, although I will say it is possible at a very very early stage before we even got our IND exemption or our IRB approval. It is possible that we said we planned to go up to six. In a very, it, it may be that maybe more than a year ago, and we were told by some patients to just go up to four. And we spoke with some of the experts who are running trials, and they said you should see yep. measurable benefit at four. So yeah, you, you, I remember you said it was uh, then also already based yeah. on expert opinion. It's we we nice have to, to move. The have the we have to move next presentation. Uh, there's a tight schedule. Thank you very much. And.